Hello, uh, I am Dr. Nasser Abu Awad. I am an obstetrician and a gynecologist. I work in a town uh, close to Toronto, Canada. I am also a part-time lecturer at the University of Ottawa and assistant professor at uh, Queen's University. It is of great honor for me to be uh, one of the presenters in the first uh, CBPF uh, symposium. Today, uh, I will be talking about uh, perinatal care and we will come across some pregnancy complications. I'm looking forward to uh, meet a few in the day of the symposium. I will start uh, my presentation by uh, giving the outlines of the, my presentation. We're gonna talk slightly about the importance and the significance of uh, pregnancy care. We'll talk about pre-pregnancy or pre-conceptional -conce care as an essential part of antenatal care. We'll talk about initial and subsequent visits, laboratory testing, nutrition during pregnancy. We will come across some common concerns during pregnancy and frequent questions we all get asked. And finally, we'll talk about some common complications during pregnancy. Why it's important to have antenatal care? In 2015, the WHO published a very scary data about pregnancy outcome. More than 300,000 women died from pregnancy-related causes. More important, 2.6 million babies were stillborn. Reviewing th these cases, many of them, many of these adverse outcomes can be provided only by providing timely and evidence-based antenatal care. So the goal of providing antenatal care is to provide health, health promotion, prevention of bad outcome, screening and diagnosis of disease. And it's also a big opportunity to communicate with women, with families and their communities. Antenatal care start with pre-pregnancy care or pre-conceptional care. And there are two main strategies or two main outlines in this aspect. The first one is to screen for the risk of genetic disease and to prevent teratogenicity. How do you screen for uh, risk of genetic disease? By asking and taking a detailed family history, history of childhood cancer, history of recurrent pregnancy losses, history of primary amenorrhea, advanced maternal and paternal age, and history of pre premature ovarian failure. Prevention of teratogenicity in pregnancy, again, by counseling and paying attention to medical conditions, for example, uh, diabetes and obesity, reviewing medications and safety of this medication during pregnancy. And it's very important always to promote for the supplementation of folic acids. Folic acid is very important. And we, we should always recommend taking folic acid at least three months before attempting pregnancy. We check infectious, uh, infections and immunization status of our patient. The most important part of this uh, uh, visit is to take a detailed history, detailed history about chronic health conditions like diabetes, hypertension, thyroid, bronchial asthma, kidney, liver, and heart disease, general health in general. And very important as well to focus on the mental and the psychiatric status of the patient. We also discuss the effect of pregnancy in uh, this, these conditions. For example, we all know that insulin requirement does increase during pregnancy. However, other autoimmune disorders like SLE may get better during pregnancy. We review our patient's medication and check their safety with the pregnancy and if necessary, we switch them to a safer medication. Counseling about infectious diseases also is important. We check the immunity for rubella and varicella. And if our patient is not immune and she is not actively attempting pregnancy, we should consider vaccination in countries or places where we have high prevalence of hepatitis B, we should always check the antibody and immunity for hepatitis B. It's very important to counsel and educate our women to avoid exposure to cat feces and eating raw and cooked meat. However, doing routine screening for toxoplasmosis before pregnancy is not recommended. 
in countries where, this, there, where there is high incidence of sexually transmitted infection, we should also screen for chlamydia, HIV, gonorrhea, and uh, syphilis. Collecting information about menstrual history is very essential, and this is very important to uh, determine the accuracy of uh, dating of pregnancy. Past obstetric history, we also ask about previous miscarriages, number of pregnancies, time of birth, length of labor, any specific complication. It's also an opportunity to remember to discuss with our patient the lifestyle uh, issues like nutritional status of our patient, physical activity, exercise. We discuss all medication, whether they're prescription medication or over-the-counter medication, other substance use, example, uh, cigarette smoking, alcohol, or any recreational drugs, and we also discuss environmental exposure. We all know that it's not always possible to have this visit before pregnancy. It's not sometimes practical. But if we are seeing patients, a young female in her reproductive age, for any different reason, whether it's in your clinic or it's in your emergency department, please, please take one minute to explain to your patient about the risk of smoking alcohol, and please promote for the usage of folic acid three months before pregnancy and during pregnancy. Now, pregnancy care and the goal of uh, the initial pregnancy evaluation is to define the health status of mother and the fetus. We need to know if our mother and the baby are healthy. We need to accurately estimate the gestational age, and we should put a plan for continuing obstetrical care. History taking, again, is very important, and thorough history taking is very important. In addition to past medical history, surgical history, allergic history, we should also take detailed obstetrical history. We should take menstrual history to accurately date the stage of pregnancy. Psychosocial screening is also important. We should always for, look for barrier for having an antenatal care or health care. Example, lack of transportation, child care and family support, unintended pre pregnancy, depression, safety, and uh, violence concerns. Cigarette smoking is also an important subject that we should always counsel our, our patients about it because there's very strong evidence that cigarette smoking does increase the risk of placenta previa, placental abruption, and premature rupture of the membranes. Also, there's an increased risk of preterm labor, intrauterine growth restriction, and small for gestational age, increased risk of spontaneous miscarriage and fetal death. The mechanism of adverse effect of cigarette smoking, mainly by fetal hypoxia and direct effect of nicotine. Smoking cessation should be always encouraged, and we should try first non-pharmacological ap uh, approach However, if we have to go for pharmacological approach, we can try this, although there is no evidence in the literature to, su to support the safety and efficacy of this approach. A thorough, detailed physical examination in our first visit is very essential. We check our patient general condition, vital signs, BMI. We do a complete chest heart examination. We do obstetric examination, it depends on the stage of pregnancy. We check the fundal height and the fetal heart. Pelvic examination is not routinely performed during our first assessment. Then after we complete our history and physical examination, we plan our pregnancy care. The standard care is to see patients every four weeks until 28 weeks, then every two weeks until 36 weeks, and then every week until delivery. In complicated pregnancy, we may need to see our patient more frequently. The WHO uh, proposed a new model that includes only four to five visits uh, during pregnancy. As we see in this table, the uh, first visit is around eight to 12 weeks, and in this visit, we confirm pregnancy and accurately uh, estimate the uh, delivery date. And again, we assess the pregnancy in this visit and we see if this is a low risk pregnancy and it is suitable for this model or if it's not then we have to go for more frequent visits 
and we do complete examination and assessment for the mother and the baby at 24 and 26 weeks will be our uh, second visit. Third visit is gonna be around 30 weeks and the fourth visit at 36 to 38 weeks. During, during the follow-up, uh, we should always check on the baby and the mother. We check, we check on the blood pressure, weight of the mother, we ask about symptoms of preeclampsia, like head, headache, altered vision, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, bleeding, and fetal movement. We check the fundal height of the pregnancy and check the presenting part and fetal heart activity. Assessment of gestational age. We measure symphysis fundal height measurement, and it is very accurate between 20 to 34 weeks of gestation. We should always put into consideration that your full urinary bladder and obesity may alter, alter our measurement. By using this measure alone, we can detect only two thirds of intrauterine growth restriction. Fetal heart sound, the normal fetal heart rate is ranging between 110 to 160. We should be able to detect the fetal heart using fetal Doppler as early as 10 weeks and by ultrasound as early as five weeks. Ultrasound assessment, typically we do an early ultrasound for diagnosis of pregnancy and dating. If we want to do uh, uh, chromosomal analysis, we do or chrom chromosomal assessment, we do another ultrasound between 11 and 13 weeks and a third ultrasound to check for the anatomy of the baby at around uh, 20 weeks. We don't have to do ultrasound every visit we see our patient. Laboratory testing, the essential tests that we need to do are CBC, blood group, and RH. Serology testing for hepatitis, HIV can be added in countries or places where we have high prevalence of these conditions, as well as screening for uh, chlamydia and uh, gonorrhea. Subsequent laboratory testing in North America, here in Canada, we offer all our patients a screening test for Down syndrome. It's a blood test and ultrasound done between 11 to 14 weeks, and it's called enhanced first trimester screening. If our patient blood type is RH negative, we repeat her antibodies at around 28 to 29 weeks before administration of uh, rogam uh, immunoglobins. We routinely screen for gestational diabetes here in North America between 24 weeks and 28 weeks. And I will talk more about this when we come to uh, diabetes and pregnancy. Group B strip is also another routine test that we do it here. We do rectovaginal swab for all our pregnant women between 35 to 37 to screen for GBS or group B strep because in our population here, GBS is positive in about 30% of the population and we know GBS can cause severe neonatal sepsis. So if we get this test positive, we treat our patient in labor by antibiotic to prevent vertical transmission to the baby. Nutrition during pregnancy. Rule number one, you should not eat for two. If you are pregnant, you should eat for yourself. An additional only of 100 to 300 kilocalories are needed. Eating for two is a major cause for uh, obesity during pregnancy. Protein is an essential element of our nutrition during pregnancy because of the increased demand of, for the developing placenta, fetus, uterus, and breast. Animal source usually is a very good source for uh, protein. Vitamins, multivitamins like vitamin A, B12, B6, vitamin C. Routine supplementation of this vitamin is not uh, recommended. Any balanced uh, diet should contain enough uh, vitamins. And unless we have uh, deficiency in one of these vitamins, there's no need to do a routine supplementation of the vitamins. And regarding minerals, the only mineral that we need to supplement during pregnancy is iron. The rest of the minerals are usually available in any balanced diet.
at the acceptable weight gain during pregnancy. It's based on pre-pregnancy weight. If our BMI is less than 20, then the acceptable weight gain should be between 12 to 18 kilograms during pregnancy. If the BMI between 20 to 26, 11.5 to 16 kilogram is acceptable weight gain during pregnancy. If we have high BMI between 26, maybe most of our patients lie in this category where uh, BMI between 26 to 29, then between 7 to, to 11.5 kilograms is acceptable weight gain and obese patient with a BMI more than 30, um, the acceptable uh, weight gain is approximately 7 kilograms during pregnancy. Now we come to the next part of uh, my presentation, which is common concerns, or is it safe? This question we always come across through it, whether during our medical practice or even in our social gathering or wedding parties or any social meetings. Is it safe? I am pregnant. Is it safe to do this? Is it safe to do that? So we'll go to the first question. Is it safe to continue working while you are pregnant? So if you want to be popular and your patient likes you and uh, be a very famous obstetrician, you say, no, you stay home. Don't work while you're pregnancy. Unfortunately, this is not the right answer. And the right answer is actually D. Yes, you should continue working during pregnancy. Even it is safe to continue working until the onset of labor. So the studies has shown that in the absence of complication, most women can continue to work until the onset of labor. Any occupation that subjects women to severe physical strain should be avoided. If we have high-risk pregnancy, like a patient with preterm labor, intrauterine growth restriction, uh, PPROM, hypertension, or any complicated pregnancy, then we should avoid physical work. And no work should be continued to, an ex to the extent that uh, cause fatigue. We should avoid physical work if previous history of uh, pregnancy complication. The second question we always get ask about it, which is exercise. Is it safe to exercise during pregnancy? The answer is yes. It is safe to continue exercising during pregnancy unless there is a risk of injury or excessive fatigue. The American College of Obstetrician and Gynecology recommends in the absence of contraindication, regular exercise of mild to moderate intensity for 30 minutes every day is reasonable and safe. Now, eating fish. The story of eating fish is because the fish has a trace element of mercury. And uh, is it safe to eat fish during pregnancy? And how much is safe? Generally, the answer, yes, it is safe. But we should not eat more than one to two serving every week. Two meals of fish every week is enough because of the concerns about the mercury content. Any type of fish that has high concentration of mercury should be avoided like shark or salt fish. Traveling during pregnancy, car travel is usually safe. And again, being pregnant is not a reason not to use a seat belt. There is a proper way to position the seat belt where you put the lab belt under the abdomen and across the upper thigh and the shoulder belt should be position between breasts. Airbags should not be disabled if you are pregnant. Air travel as well is safe and no harmful, it's not harmful until the 36 weeks of gestation, but we should always take the same precaution like non-pregnant uh, uh, people, like drink a lot of fluid, uh, don't stay the whole time, uh, try to move around, move your legs and all uh, routine precautions, especially in long travel. Dental care during pregnancy is yes. Again, we should continue having dental treatment pre, uh, during pregnancy if we need it. In fact, dental examination should be included in prenatal examination and good, good dental hygiene should be encouraged. There is strong evidence that periodontal disease has link with preterm labor. Dental cares are not aggravated by pregnancy 
and pregnancy itself is not a contraindication to do dental treatment, including dental x-ray. Immunization during pregnancy. All women who will be pregnant during influenza season or the flu season should offer the vaccine regardless of gestational age. So the flu vaccine is safe to, to be taken regardless of the stage of pregnancy. Women who are susceptible to rubella, and again, this is a routine practice here. We screen our uh, rubella, our patient for their rubella immunity, and if they're not immune, we give them the vaccine immediately after delivery. The new thing uh, that we started to practice maybe the last two years that we vaccinate all pregnant women with the tetanus diphtheria pertussis vaccine, or we call it here TDAP. The vaccine should be given between 21 to 32 weeks in every pregnancy, irrespective of prior immunization history. Pre pregnant, pregnant and breastfeeding women were excluded from phase two and phase three uh, studies for Pfizer biotech COVID vaccine. I will have a few slides about COVID vaccine uh, toward the end of uh, my presentation. Drinking coffee, we all love our coffee. And there are some animal studies still that uh, too much caffeine can cause a mutation. And there's a famous study that was published in 2008 uh, called the Keller study. It shows that the risk of IUGR, if we drink more than two milligram of caffeine uh, every day, it goes higher with an odds ratio of 1.4. Doing x-ray again, teeth x-ray or lung x-ray are usually safe because the dose of radiation that we use for this type of x-ray is very small and it's not teratogenic. However, we should avoid doing routine x-rays. We have to do x-rays only if it's going to change our management or it's going to help us in treating our patient. And we should always, always tell that we are pregnant and we need to wear a uh, uh, lid, apron, or sh shield to cover the abdomen. Now, we, I get asked these questions a lot in my practice. Is it safe to dye my hair while I am pregnant? The answer is yes, it is safe, but with caution. We can do it occasionally during pregnancy, and I always advise my patient to avoid the first 12, 13 weeks or the first trimester of pregnancy before starting uh, using uh, hair color or hair dye. And to make dyeing hair safer, use semi-permanent dyes or highlights. Don't use the dyes that you need to do it every couple of days. Make sure the treatment is done in a well-ventilated area. Do a patch test for allergic reaction before starting. Carefully follow the direction. Wear gloves when applying treatment. Do not leave chemicals on your hair or scalp longer than indicated and rinse thoroughly, rinse your scalp thoroughly after you do the treatment. Now, the last uh, aspect of my presentation is uh, medical disorders uh, during pregnancy. The first part is gonna be about heart disease and pregnancy. Luckily, the incidence of heart disease during pregnancy is not high. The incidence is between 0.1% to 4%. And the most common cause of heart disease during pregnancy is congenital heart disease. It accounts for 70 to 80% of all heart diseases during pregnancy. Very important to know normal cardiovascular changes in pregnancy. Uh, we all know that the cardiac output increased by 40 to 50% during pregnancy, and this increment of the car cardiac output is related to increased heart rate and stroke volume. This start around the five weeks of gestation and the peak happen between 26 to 28 weeks of gestation. The heart rate increased normally in pregnancy between 10 to 15 beat per minute. Blood volume also increased by 50% and the plasma volume does increase more than red blood cells. Therefore, dilutional anemia is very common, particularly around 30 to 32 weeks of gestation. Again, normal cardiovascular changes 
during pregnancy, a drop in the blood pressure is common during pregnancy, and the drop is more in the diastolic blood pressure more than systolic due to drop in the systemic vascular uh, resistance. And pregnancy is a well-known hypercoagulable state, secondary to decrease of anticoagulants like protein as an increase of clotting factors, commonly factors 7, 8, 9, 12, and fibrinogen. Examination of uh, uh, the heart during pregnancy, mildly increased JVP is normal during pregnancy, diffuse apex pulsation, split heart sounds, occasional S3 gallops, and mid-systolic uh, murmur is normal and physiological during pregnancy. Concerning signs, or sorry, concerning symptoms, if we have pregnant women with the following symptoms, we should be very concerned and we should treat her aggressively. First one is progressive shortness of breath, PNDs or orthopnea, nocturnal cough, hemoptysis, syncope, and uh, chest pain. Concerning symptoms, including cyanosis, clubbing, Persistently elevated JVP, systolic murmur more than three over six. Any death murmur is significant and serious during pregnancy. It's not physiological. Persistent cardiac arrhythmia and cardiomegaly. Functional classification of uh, heart disease during pregnancy. There are multiple classification. I like the New York Heart Association classification because it is widely used and it's very simple to understand. Class one uh, patient is asymptomatic with ordinary activity. Class two with ordinary activity, uh, the patient is symptomatic and having symptoms of decompensation. Class three symptoms with less than ordinary activity and uh, class four, is the patient is symptomatic at risk. Risk factors for mortality. If you have a uh, New York Heart Association class three or four, this is quite serious and termination of pregnancy should be considered and discussed with the patient. Cyanotic heart disease uh, carries high risk of maternal mortality. Prayer heart failure, TIA, CVA or arrhythmia, left heart obstruction, severe mitral stenosis less than two centimeter or severe arctic stenosis less 1.5 centimeter or ejection fraction less than 40 percent management of cardiac disease during pregnancy it has to be multidisciplinary team that involves high risk obstetrician or maternal fetal medicine if available a cardiologist anesthetist and pediatrician the second disorder that I would like to discuss during pregnancy is diabetes, and diabetes can be a pre-existing diabetes or pre-gestational diabetes, which includes type 1 and type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes. The difference in management of both condition is in pre in pre-gestational diabetes, we should pay attention on preconceptional counseling. Our target is to have a hemoglobin A1C below seven before attempting pregnancy. Otherwise, the rest of the management is the same regarding glycemic control during pregnancy for both pregestational or gestational diabetes. Management of labor is the same and postpartum consideration is the same. As we see in this slide, our target is to have a strict hemoglobin A1C before attending pregnancy and ideally below seven. If we manage to keep our uh, hemoglobin A1C below seven, the risk of congenital abnormality is less than 3%. However, this risk goes more than 10% if our hemoglobin A1C is around 11. So glycemic, pre glycemic control preconception is very essential. Again, the preconception checklist for women in pre-existing diabetes, number one, tight glycemic control, hemoglobin A1 seven less than, sorry, hemoglobin A1C is less than seven. We should assess and manage complication of diabetes before pregnancy like diabetic mm -hmm. nephropathy and diabetic um, uh, retinopathy. And um, 
switch to insulin if she's an oral hypoglycemic agent and uh, folic acid supplementation at least three months before pregnancy to 12 week post conception. Finally, discontinue medication that are not safe during pregnancy. How do we diagnose gestational diabetes? In North America, we recommend universal screening. We screen all our pregnant women with uh, glucose challenge tests between 24 to 28 weeks. This, this, uh, we, can, we may need to do it a little bit earlier if we have any risk factor of gestational diabetes. Diagnosis of gestational diabetes, again, this is the preferred approach where we screen all our pregnant women between 28 and if we get positive screening tests, then we go for more diagnostic tests. Unless we get, if we get a very high glucose result, like more than 11.1, then this is a diagnostic and it's enough to start treatment. Benefits of managing gestational diabetes. This meta-analysis showed there is large benefit of controlling blood sugar for gestational diabetes in terms of large for gestational day, age with an odds ratio of uh, 0.48 and significant uh, confidence interval. The same applied for fetal macrosomia and shoulder dystocia. Our target in managing gestational diabetes is to keep the fasting level below five and one hour below 7.8 and two hours below 6.7. We start by nutritional counseling and if for two weeks and if this failed to bring the sugar within the target, we consider starting insulin and in some cases oral hypoglycemic agent can be used in patients non-adherent or refusing to take insulin. Postpartum checklist for gestational diabetes, we should encourage breastfeeding, 75 glucose tolerance test six weeks after, discuss increased risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and the next disorder or medical disorder during pregnancy is high blood pressure during pregnancy. Hypertension is defined by having a blood pressure more than 40 over 90 in two occasions at least 15 minutes apart done on the same arm while severe hypertension is one, more than 160 over 100, same in two occasions, 15 minutes in the same arm, and resistant hypertension, uh, the hypertension that require more than three antihypertensive treatment. Risk factor for preeclampsia include previous preeclampsia, multiple gestation, antiphospholipid antibodies, pre-existing diabetes, hypertension, or renal disease, Prevention, this is very important, slight prevention of preeclampsia for low risk population, a gram of calcium every day if low dietary intake, patient with high risk of preeclampsia. In addition to the calcium, we should uh, offer uh, low dose aspirin between 75 to 162 milligram before 16 weeks, and we should stop at 36 weeks. Management of high blood pressure should Strict rest is not recommended. Hospitalization can help in severe cases. Blood investigation for preeclampsia, close fetal observation. Uh, the target is to maintain blood pressure below 140 over 90 and corticosteroid to enhance lung maturity and uh, magnesium sulfate for severe preeclampsia. The last part of my presentation, which is the COVID-19 and pregnancy. And it's very important to know that this information is changing and the last update was in uh, the middle of february so if you read different information in the future this is normal so luckily the majority of uh, pregnant women who get uh, who got covid19 experience mild to moderate illness compared to non-pregnant women there is a higher increase there is an increased risk of admission to ICU with an odds ratio of 1.6 with significant confidence interval. In ICU admission and ventilation also higher in pregnancy. Same uh, other comorbidities add to the additional risk for severe uh, COVID-19 test uh, disease. And luckily the mortality is the same for non-pregnant uh, women. The last aspect uh, is the vaccination, and because now vaccination is offered, and uh, it's important to know that we don't have safety or efficacy data available now about breastfeeding. Pregnant and breastfeeding were excluded from phase two and three trials. However, there were 20, uh, sorry, 23 women 
were found to be pregnant who received the vaccine and they were monitored closely and none of them developed any adverse effect. There's animal studies going on for the Moderna Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine and there's no safety concerns or signals yet. Our college, the Society of Obstetrician and Gynecology recommend that pregnant women and breastfeeding women who are eligible for COVID-19 vaccine due to exposure risk or medical status or any other circumstances should be able to make an informed decision and she should, they should have uh, access to the information including clear information about the data that is not yet available. And I think this is the end of uh, my presentation. I would like uh, thank you very to thank you very much for your attention.